Greetings everyone and welcome to our series, The Three Angels Messages Made Simple. Now in this part we are going to continue point two on this section, Fear God. And as I hope and pray friends that the revelation of truth has not only been watched but also taken heeded of. You know I've expressed in the past that this is not just simply information for information's sake because information will not get you anywhere until you put the information into practice. Now I just want to give a verse which expresses this for the Bible says in 1 John chapter 3 verse 18, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. It's always been about actions my friends and decisions to live on the decisions that we make. And I pray it has been the right decisions. For now in Fear God we are going to continue in this pointer, Fear God points to obedience. Commandment number five, honor thy father and thy mother. Now in a generation where children can at times be uncontrolled, rude and even disobedient, God commands this for the children and even adults who still have parents. We are not only to obey our parents but also respect our parents, which could include lightening their load, lightening their burdens of everyday life, their reputation, and to also remember that how we treat our parents is ultimately how we would respect or show respect to our Father in Heaven, our Heavenly Parent. But be that as it may, parents, you also have to be careful to show the proper love and tenderness to your children that they rebel not that they have no resentment and go away from the parental rule. For the children copy the examples of the parents rather than what they actually say. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Commandment number six, thou shalt not kill. All acts of injustice that tend to shorten life, the spirit of hatred and revenge, or the indulgence of any passion that leads to injurious acts towards another or causes us even to wish them harm. Now when looked at in this area of character I can personally see a long list of practical events in life. Someone may be doing you wrong and you want to take revenge or may even hate them. That spirit comes from murder as well as unforgiveness. But we can go deeper. This could also be talking about what you eat and what you drink, for that too causes death when you understand what goes into your body. So smoking, greasy foods, drinking alcohol, even these sweets loaded with sugar which shuts down your immune system and many other edible items can cause death and you know this. And it's difficult when the world starts to glorify unhealthy lifestyles which result in death. Mr. Mib, <laughs> no, I've just heard it said there that you can be fat and healthy. Actually, you can't be. No. Um, you're always somewhat unhealthy. There's a big study done on 17,000 people, and they were heavy, mm. and they did regular exercise. And those people were still a third more likely to have a heart attack than mm. people who were in normal weight. The most inspiring but thing Tess Holliday could now do, in my view, is actually say, right, I am now going to lose a hundred pounds. She, she doesn't need to. She doesn't need to. She doesn't care what that. She doesn't care. She doesn't care. She does. She, 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 Another example could be gossip. Talking about somebody behind their back to damage their reputation could cause a death to that individual as they may end up going to a point of hopelessness and embarrassment, not wanting to live anymore. And even the words we say to others can promote life or death. Breaking down someone just because of how they look or what race they are or particular behaviours which isn't part of the common appeal which causes self-esteem issues, all of these are a violation of this commandment. 
death and life are in the power of the tongue. Commandment number seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. This commandment forbids not only acts of impurity, but sensual thoughts and desires, or any practice that tends to excite them. Friends, it's a violation of this commandment that is breaking families apart. The amount of infidelity, the lustful programs, the hormonal activity and some revelation that says people are not as what they think they are, and the way the world tells us what to look for in a man and in a woman are the means of which adultery is encouraged and practiced. In the secrets of another person's bed, other than your husband or wife, or even in the secret recesses of your mind, and even on the websites that fulfill these terrible lusts. By all of these manifestations, we need to make a clear declaration with the Lord not to watch the programs, talk of the topics in that manner, and do whatever it takes to not go down that road, for this not only destroys families, but it also destroys a nation. Because family spawns from such as these, corrupt behaving children spawns from such as these, and many other tragedies. Paul talking of these sins concludes in saying this hard saying, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Hence why I mentioned not to watch the things that people do which violate this commandment. I made an agreement with my eyes not to look at a young woman in a way that would make me want her. And as Jesus expressed in life determinations and not literal behavior so that this is not misunderstood, and if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, or get rid of that thing, and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not thy whole body should be cast into hell. Now I understand this is a very deep subject matter which this world freely promotes, and some of you even at this time are struggling with things like pornography. I've made a three part series on how to overcome pornography which is one of the main leading causes that is going on in the youth today. Now if you're watching this on YouTube you can click on the link in the description box or you can search for the title in YouTube. I pray that these practical tools will give you the tools to overcome not in this area but in every other area that is linked to this commandment. Commandment number 8, thou shalt not steal. Both public and private sins are included in this prohibition. It demands strict integrity in the minutest details of the affairs of life. Now this is another list that can go on and on. Some of these may include illegal downloading. It could go as far as going out with a woman you like without even consulting their parents, for that woman belongs to their parents. Before I got married, for example, I had to go to my wife's mother and ask for her hand in marriage, and it was a blessing because there was a state of peace when you know that you are accepted. Now we also have general imaginations which includes thinking of what you want to do with somebody else's item robbing individuals, breaking into someone's home and taking their items, and even dishonesty in business transactions even though the other person may be unaware. These and more are ideas where thou shalt not steal can be understood. But a big one, and I want us to understand it, is when the Bible says this. For ye are bought with a price, therefore Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Which means then that anything and everything we should be doing should be according to God's glory. If it is done outside of God's glory, we are stealing from God. We will be covering this further in this series, The Three Angels' Messages Made Simple, The First Angels' Message. Commandment number nine. Thou shalt not bear 
false witness. Lies. Lies, lies, lies. It all started with a lie. From the time when Satan told that lie that created this sinful world up to this moment in time, lies can be understood as the mouth of Satan. And I'm not surprised just how light he has made lies today under his craft, his schemes and his deception. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. So what are the common lies that are swept under the rug that we may not be deceived? False speaking in any matter. Every attempt or purpose to deceive our neighbor is here included. An intention to deceive is what constitutes falsehood. And it goes so much deeper by saying even by a glance of the eye, a motion of the hand, an expression of their countenance, a falsehood may be told as effectually as by words. All intentional overstatements, every hint or insinuation calculated to convey an error or exaggerated impression, even the statement of facts in such a manner as to mislead is falsehood. Even the intentional suppression of truth by which injury may result to others is a violation of the ninth commandment. So what about statements like this? I can't say this, it will hurt their feelings, or I'll just say that it looks good or it tastes nice, or even telling a joke to deceive, or even giving all but one piece of information. What about April Fools? The common phrase such as white lies or even innocent things like surprise birthday parties which have been kept to be a surprise through the process of lies. All these are common deceptions that Satan has worked so hard on which has now become exposed. And lastly, commandment number 10, thou shall not covet. This, my friends, encompasses all the other six commandments in this section. For in order to want to commit adultery, you must have to covet one's wife or husband. If you want that item that belongs to someone else, you must first covet the item. And you may even kill in the process of getting what they have. And most importantly, if you want to be selfish, you must neglect everything, every need, and stick to your own personal wants. When Jesus spoke to the rich young ruler who asked what he must do to inherit eternal life, Jesus listed all the commandments that pertain to your fellow man. He said to honor your mother and father, don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery and don't lie, purposely leaving out thou shalt not covet for a bit later. For Christ in his wisdom stuck at the root of the commandment which is all about himself the rich young ruler, me, 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 myself, and I. And this is what the Bible says about the matter. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. And when he heard this, the rich young ruler, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. You see friends, the Ten Commandments are deeper than we thought. David expressed, I have seen an end of all perfection, meaning that he's seen the limitations of everything on this earth, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. This means that if you think you know the law, my friends, which is simply the law of love, you have not yet understand the depths of the law of God. For the law of God is a transcript of his character. It is as holy as himself. It is spiritual as we understood earlier in our study. 
for many of you would not have known that the sin that thou shalt not covet blocked access to the character of kindness, of consideration, of looking at others rather than yourself. And again, it is Satan's deception to suggest that the Ten Commandments are different from loving one another, being kind, being able to give to the poor, praying for others, forgiving, etc. But when we look at the law of God, my friends, I believe you and I have committed these sins in one way, shape or form, or even altogether. And friends, I can assuredly say and confess that I have broken all of God's commandments. For I can see how I was a servant of the devil, to the point that I was not only committed in sin, but making excuses for my sins due to my hardness of heart, my pride and my delusions, so to think that I am saved and accepted in this condition. And I'm sure, friends, that as you ponder over these thoughts, the courses of your actions and the current courses in your present life, you too can admit the same. But I want you to repeat this verse together with me because this sums up the genuine experience of the one who has come to this realization of their condition. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. With that said, friends, take courage with what promises are left for us. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. But God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being justified or being freed by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And friends, when we come to the point of fearing God with these precious promises of God, we can surely claim this promise. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. Friends, fearing God is the surety to know that no matter how sinful you are or you are being right now, after seeing how deep your sins go, God's love is so great that he expresses that you can have hope, blessed hope in his mercy. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Thank you very much for watching friends and please be encouraged that though fearing God will pose some challenges because there is a constant battle of minds, especially as this revelation of God's law of love will pose some mental wrestling to make a decision to follow him instead of our own ways, just remember God will come through for us if we let him. Now I end on these couple of verses and this quote and we will close. No outward observance can take the place of simple faith and entire renunciation of self. But no man can empty himself of self. We can only consent for Christ to do the work. Then the language of our soul will be, Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. It is thy property. Keep it pure, for I cannot keep it for thee. Save me in spite of myself, my weak unchrist like self. Mold me, fashion me, raise me into a pure and holy atmosphere where the rich current of thy love can flow through my soul. It is not only at the beginning of the Christian life that this renunciation of self is to be made. At every advanced step heavenward it is to be renewed. All our good works are dependent on a power outside of ourselves. Therefore, there needs to be a continual reaching out of the heart after God, a continual, earnest, heartbreaking confession of sin and humbling of the soul before Him. Only by constant renunciation of self and dependence on Christ can we safely walk. 
And as a result of this word, friends, the word of God tells us, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And as a result of this, friends, notice this promise. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Which means the spirit of God will then enable you to keep his words. And as a result of this experience gained, the result will be the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the forward mouth do I hate. Amen. Thank you very much friends once again and we will see you in the last pointer of Fear God as we continue our series, The Three Angels' Messages Made Simple. God bless.